Vasily, welcome. Uh, I uh, I almost feel you should be interviewing me today instead of the other way around because you've been pretty busy during lockdown doing a whole series of, of conversations with people from different disciplines in the arts. Thank you, Ed. Uh, it's a pleasure to talk to you. <laughs> I still think that you can interview better than I do, but uh, this series for me was an exploration in the spring and early summer uh, about how the pandemic, how the COVID affected different sectors of industry in the different parts of the world and what are the current situation by then. Actually, uh, in the autumn, I started another series which could, which could, call, could be called as uh, Open Up. Mm -hmm. And I've done two episodes, but then the all Europe uh, and actually a lot of other countries in the world, they were going opposite direction. So mm -hmm. instead of opening up further due to the increase in the new cases, uh, all the countries started to have a lockdowns. So this mm -hmm. is probably on hold at the moment. Hopefully in 2021, uh, there will be... Uh, easier situation and yeah. so there will be more opening ups everywhere. Well, this is such a new experience for, for all of us that people have taken time to become uh, resourceful and creative and find new ways of achieving the same things. But there's no substitute for, a, a, you know, live music with a, a full audience interacting in the way that we know and love. Um, uh, I've, I've just been listening to your um, uh, your newest release on the Norwegian label Lawo, um, Prokofiev's Fifth Symphony, and interestingly, uh, Miaskowski's Twenty First. Um, my my musical education is a little incomplete when it comes to Miaskowski's Twenty Seven Symphonies, um, but this one I do know because I think, like a lot of people, um, we all fall for that fabulous lyric melody and the strings. Uh, that that makes it so distinctive. I'd say not only this one melody; it's one of the gems in all his heritage. Number twenty-one. It's probably the shortest of all of them. Yeah. Uh, it also has this incredible launching clarinet start at the very beginning. Yes, yeah, beautiful. And uh, to me, to couple it with uh, Prokofiev uh, was very interesting. They were contemporary. They lived at the same time. The difference between them was that Prokofiev was able to leave Soviet Union and spent quite a few years uh, in New York and then in Europe and then returned back, which uh, to me personally, he actually he tried to exchange probably personal freedom into the freedom of composition. Uh-huh. Uh, he knew about the communists, and actually, if you read his diaries, especially 1921, 1923, uh, there's a lot of parallels from what have happened 100 years ago. He was in a time of uh, Spanish flu in New York. Gosh, and, that's interesting. And uh, the, the diaries actually lead quite a lot of interesting comparisons and yeah, parallels. Yeah, with what we're going through now, yeah. Uh, so, on one hand, and I guess at that time, obviously, with the medicine being at a very different level than it is now, mm. and with uh, the general sanitary of the people being on a very different uh, level, uh, this that was much, 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 much more severe pandemic. Mm. And Prokofiev himself, he was worried that he will go to flu. Uh, however, he got a scarlatin. And uh, he had this high fever, and he thought that he m may die, literally. Mm. But he recovered from Scarlatine and then went back to Soviet Union. The difference, though, when that all throughout the diary, even in, this, in a very, very dark days, when he noticeably saying that this neighbor passed away or that neighbor passed away due to the pandemic, the concert life was still going ahead. Mm. Mm. They were not closing theaters or concert halls. Everything was going as normal, let's say. Mm. Yes. And mm. uh, uh, then he returned back, and he had this freedom of composition. Uh, in Soviet Union, in, if you look into all those processes against Soviet composers, Shostakovich was targeted a lot. Mm. Prokofiev, by far less. That's interesting, yeah. And Why do you think I, that was? Well, I think partly because of this early story with his wife, and Beria and all this uh, thing which he felt guilty because she was repressed and he could have saved her, mm. but maybe not. Uh, it's uh, very difficult to say, but he could have written a letter or something, but there was this, uh, at least there's the rumors, there was this chat with Beria where uh, whatever happened between those two, 
uh, they find some kind of agreement, and then Prokofiev was able to write the symphonies. Yeah. But their approach to life were quite different. Prokofiev was, at the beginning, Anfant Terrible. He was writing rebellious music, especially in early st yeah. stages, Indeed. in the age of steel. You're talking also about classical symphony as rebellious p piece in many ways. <laughs> and then he crystallized uh, quite a lot. Uh, so towards so his later stages, it, he's much, much more transparent in terms of orchestration. He, uh, I would say he had a very clear message. And that, that message, emotional, philosophical message in uh, late Prokofiev was clear, much clearer than in the early mm. uh, music. And Miskovsky, he was the last pupil, one of the last pupils of Rimsky-Korsakov, and he was fully in that tradition. Right. Obviously, he adopted a lot of things from the 20th century classical music language, but uh, they called him uh, a nobleman. Mm. <laughs> uh, he was probably from aristocracy, you know, the, all those roots and traces and relations after the revolution, people were trying to hide them for obvious reasons, mm. but they treated him almost as an aristocrat, as, as a nobleman. Well, he, However, was he was rewarded, wasn't he, with more oh, yeah. Stalin prizes than anybody else, I believe. Uh, but for him there were two sides. First was very practical, public side, you know, like amongst those uh, symphonies, there's aviational one, there's agricultural one, because they were commissioned by the cooperatives who were paying for Miskovsky for, for those commissions. Yeah. And there are also several pieces uh, for the glory of Soviets and for the glory of Stalin. Uh, but there is all, also the other side, uh, mainly in his chamber music, but also in some symphonies like 21. When it's those sorrows, when it's those deep thoughts about uh, the faith of the country, the faith of the people, the faith of the folks. Mm. And for me, it was very interesting to pair those two. Prokofiev 5 and Miskovsky 21, they're written literally in the same year. Uh, yeah. And Prokofiev 5, this is uh, the piece for the heroic efforts of the Soviet people at the back of the front line. So somewhere you know, far in Siberia where people were starving, where people were really suffering from everything, but they were still working day and night just to bring victory to the country, to supply things for the front line, to grow the things for the European part, and that was really, really, really hard life. But everybody mm -hmm. understood the efforts. And in many ways, uh, this the whole Fifth Symphony is about this effort and then various other aspects of the life, like, for instance, bureaucrats in the Scherzo. As you clearly, you can almost hear us, the typing machines there. <laughs> yeah. And uh, there's also this night music, which he... Uh, reused from his ballet Pig Dam, which he didn't complete it. Mm -hmm. And then in the finale of the Fifth Symphony, there's uh, this moment when this enthusiasm, almost industrial enthusiasm of building up. Yes, it's uh, very news. machinistic, isn't it? It, yep. it sounds like machine. I always think of the coda as, as sounding like a, a dog chasing its own tail, actually. It just, it's this machine perpetual motion. Uh, it is perpetual motion, but it's also, you know, at that time, uh, after Stalingrad, people already in Soviet Union, they felt that uh, this turning point in the war is past. So they were feeling that the victory is definitely will be for Soviets. Yes. Uh, so for that, it's also probably the building of the new society after it, the building of something new, constructions. Yes. But this enthusiasm, uh, to me at least, uh, it feels like it's over the top. Mm -hmm. That's why right at the very, very end in this coda, just literally the last 30 seconds or 40 seconds of music, there's this quartet of the soloists of the strings. Yeah. It sounds as almost they become mad from, yeah. 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 from this enthusiasm, from this constant pressure, work, 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 work. Yes. And uh, also it's written the way uh, which is barely playable. It mm. deliberately, Prokofiev knew exactly what he wanted to write. <laughs> and then uh, this last outburst, literally in the last couple of bars uh, of the interview, it still leaves to me the question, is it really celebratory end or is it a question mark? Is it open end? Yeah. It's not like some other of the symphonies which clearly ending with the victory of something. And on the contrary, Miskovsky... Uh, this is more about the sorrow and about the grief of the individuals. It's not about the mass people working or mass effort. It's about uh, the spiritual life and emotions of someone 
who's feeling all the pain and who's feeling all the laments of the wartime, who's not at the battlefront, who is at the back constantly seeing news or feeds and probably receiving him or herself the letters from the front line mm -hmm. and sometimes just to document that such and such just passed away. It's so for that, they are very different approach for at the same year. It's very, it's very interesting hearing it. Um, you, you don't often hear the Prokofiev um, symphony discussed from the Russian perspective. Um, you know, we in the West have become used to hearing it discussed in, in, in more general terms, you know, more abstract terms, if you like. Um, I, I don't know about you, but in that trio in the scherzo, that very slinky, smooth trio, um, I hear American influence in that. I don't know that from his exile days. Do you hear that? I think so, you know, I think I even said to the orchestra when I was rehearsing and recording with them that this is probably a jazz singer of certain size uh -huh. who is, however, not hesitating to dance and to show uh, probably her qualities. <laughs> so for that, yes, there's this moment... Uh, uh, I think that probably, if, if you talk about the Soviet times, it's the same bureaucrats who were very official and very uh, resilient to any decisions, to make any decisions in their uh, work time, and who then were coming to those restaurants where all what they were condemning at the daytime was, was allowed. Mm. Mm. Yeah. It's a terrific performance, Vasily. Um, uh, really terrific. Um, uh, let's talk about the slow movement a little, because there are clear parallels here with um, Romeo and Juliet, I think, and uh, that kind of um, wonderfully enchanted, um, uh, exquisite kind of traceries of sound. There's a, there's, there, there, there's, there's a real parallel there, I think. And... Um, you, of course, for a time, were conducting ballet, weren't you, in, in the Opera House uh, in St. Petersburg. Um, I mean, how do you adapt your approach, for example? First of all, do you see the parallels that I'm talking about with Romeo and Juliet? Well, there's a parallel with uh, Sin in the Garden, uh, yeah. with, uh, with the night scene. Uh, obviously, it's the same composer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, oh, clearly. Uh, uh, but uh, he... Uh, he started to write a ballet pig down. He really wanted to write this ballet. And then he abandoned the idea, I think mainly because he had seen such a great success of opera by Tchaikovsky. Mm. And Prokofiev, uh, he's very interesting per person in person, I think. He's, he had this dualism as well. On one hand, he was very, uh, how to say, a show-up man. He he always wore the expensive clothes by Soviet standards. He right. was always uh, clearly very shaved in a, yes. in, in a very good shape. You know, there's uh, memoirs of the other composers when they all together were spending time in those houses of composers in the summertime when they all had the summer vacation holidays. That Prokofiev was notoriously difficult to them because if the breakfast was starting at 7.30, he would be there at 7.30. Mm. If the tennis lesson starts at 10.30, he will be there at 10.30. And uh, they, of course, on vacation, they all had a different nights. And uh, in the daytime, they were not so precise and not so scrupulous. He was one of those. Yeah. On the other side, he had this abstract feeling and actually, I think, self-confidence, which was extremely high on the outs outskirts. Inside, he probably had it by far less. Mm. So that was one of the moments why I think he hadn't completed this big dumb ballet because he thought that for him it will be number two piece after Tchaikovsky. He always wanted to be number one, and he hadn't had so much self-confidence to complete the piece and to try to compete with Tchaikovsky. Mm. So this is a music extracted from this unfinished ballet, and for his, he hadn't indicated what is exactly, what scene exactly he put into the symphony and what scene exactly was completed. But uh, to me, it's like night scene in the bedroom of Lisa. Yeah. yeah and, I see. You, and when you feel it, and I, uh, for me, uh, it's one of those very picturesque, and in my mind, there's immediately visual pictures of the white night in St. Petersburg. Mm. 
But it's now you mention of, it, I can, I can, I can, I can hear that. But of, uh, the the first thing that comes to mind when I hear it is is Romeo and Juliet. Uh, th- th- you know, everybody should have its own parallels, <laughs> I guess. For me, I think it's because I spent so m- so many white nights uh, in my hometown. Of course. But uh, I have to say, for this moment, it's one of the most difficult movements. Mm. Uh, by various reasons. Uh, first of all, uh, we are playing, uh, I think, in considerably slower tempo than a lot of other recordings. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. However, uh, this is not. This is still faster than Prokofiev wanted. Really. Uh, and uh, I'm not sure uh, that if you play exactly in the tempo he indicated nowadays, uh, this music will be appreciated, to be honest. Yes. Yeah. And secondary, uh, this constant two versus three in the various voices in the orchestra, mm. uh, that gives the orchestra a really, really, really hard time, to be honest, in mm. the, to, f- to fit all the notes and to be in ensemble to basically play together and not lose the feeling of melodic lines. It's it's very, very hard moment, especially for strings. Well, it, it feels, it sounds very beautiful in, in your performance and and it, it, it seems to create its own space, which is, I suppose, the effect one, one needs to achieve with that movement. You mentioned Tchaikovsky just now. Um, obviously, the three great classical ballets, um, uh, which... Are in some ways unparalleled. I think Romeo and Juliet of Prokofiev, and I've been listening to your recording with Oslo, um, is probably the most significant other ballet, other than the Tchaikovsky ballets from our time. Uh, in, if, you, in... if you talk about the Soviet ballets uh, at that time, obviously Stravinsky. Yes, as well. of course. Uh, but they in the modern choreography. Romeo and Juliet is somewhere on the edge of the modern and traditional choreography, mm, isn't mm. it? And the music-wise as well. Yeah. There's also a very famous Glazun of Raimonda, which yes. is a beautiful music. Yeah. And then you're going into the ballets from which people know the fragments. It's a Spartak, <laughs> or Spartacus, and yeah. uh, it's Gaiane. There's yeah. those two the by Hachatorian. Yeah. And then there's a few by Shostakovich, but they are on the smaller scale. Shostakovich mm. actually, he never felt that the ballet music is the most important for him. He no. was expressing himself mainly in symphonic genre. But I think I think Romeo and Juliet of, of Prokofiev is a real masterpiece, I think it, it's, it's... It's definitely, I, I think after those three great Tchaikovsky ballets, probably the most performed yeah. of uh, the other Russian or Soviet ballets. So let me ask you about when you're conducting um, for dancers in the, in, in the theatre and adjusting when you're performing purely for concert purposes. Is that frustrating to have to accommodate um, physical movement um, a tempi perhaps that you would not normally choose. Uh, it's opposite, actually. Uh, for when you conduct it in a concert, then you have your freedom, and actually you're following what the composer written much more than when you conduct uh, with dancers. Because with dancers, you have to uh, first of all you have to follow the logic of the body. Mm. which you have to know and feel. And every dancer has a different day. So sometimes certain things are faster, sometimes certain things are slower. You should understand it. And this is, uh, it's trainable, but initially it is a gift. There's a lot of great conductors who can't conduct ballets. <laughs> the, the, the dancers are literally yelling on them because they don't understand the the body structure and the body logic. Uh, but... Uh, on the other hand, there are so many things were changed. Now, if you if you talk about the Swan Lake, for instance, mm. uh, the original score is so different from what goes on in the in the ballet performances. There's even yes. act swap. Uh, there's plenty of uh, cuts. There's uh, Tchaikovsky say that he had written everything of it, but. I'm not sure that in the ballet all the music written by him. It might be that some of it was just uh, given by Petipa. Okay. So uh, it it is very different. And uh, the challenge, though, uh, when you're conducting ballet, the challenge is very, is very visible. So it has to be together with the ballerina or the dancers or yeah. one or groups or maybe sometimes it's just a change of the color or light mm. on stage. Mm. And uh, you have to 
adjust the music and adjust the music way that it sounds logic. It, st- it sounds very coherent with what you see. When you perform it in a concert, you don't have a dancer. So with your music, you have to give even more imaginative moments to the listeners that they can imagine the story going in their minds and probably with their closed eyes, which you sure. pictureize only by music. Sure, interesting. Um, how would you... Um, uh, I mean, obviously, you, you have a number of orchestras you have relationships with. Uh, as far as Oslo is concerned, how would you define their character? Um, because um, uh, th- th- listening to these Prokofiev performances... Um, uh, you, you, you know, you've managed to to coach them well in the manner of Russian music, and um, uh, but they have a, a, a very distinct timbre, a very dark sound. Um, I don't know. How would you define them? Uh, talking about Russian music, first of all, you know, I'm not the first conductor with from Saint Petersburg, <laughs> even <laughs> because obviously, uh, uh, Maris Janssons put them at the spotlight and then to the top of, course, of the orchestra I mean, three years ago. Yes. And this tradition still there, uh, even okay. if there's only, I think, one or two players uh, left who were spending years with him at that time. Uh, talking about uh, character, uh, they, you know, as every orchestra, I think they in many ways reflecting mentality of the place. The orchestra, it's very interesting that the orchestras in general are very international. I think we counted uh, once uh, in our centenary season in Oslo that we had 28 nationalities in the orchestra. Yeah, okay. But uh, it's mentality of the Oslo as city and it's mentality of Norway as country mm. which reflects in their sound. It's, uh, it's very difficult to describe in one or two words. Uh, they quite introverted people in general comparing to British people, for instance. Mm. Uh, this, there's a very famous proverb that to make a friend, uh, you have to live on the same street at least 15 years in Norway. <laughs> uh, and th- their, their mindset is that uh, I'm enjoying the nature, so it's very much nature-oriented. Mm. And there's beautiful nature. I mean, it's one of the yeah, most of beautiful countries in the world. And uh, it's also, I'm, first of all, I'm thinking and I'm improving myself. And I'm not caring so much about the, na- the neighbor, as in many other countries. Mm-hmm. Uh, at the same time, they ready to help, if you ask, obviously. I mean, it's not arrogance. It's not uh, kind of barriers. It's just natural way of being there. And uh, in some ways, this also reflects in the orchestra. Obviously, orchestra is a teamwork. Mm. And uh, the players are extremely, in majority, obviously, majority of the players are extremely supportive to each other. But uh, what I have seen, especially at the beginning, as my challenges and my task is to extract this enormous power and enormous passion from their hearts and from their souls, which they have which uh, in some ways are covered by the layers of ice. Mm. <laughs> so uh, you, when you get to know the people closer, you obviously find out all those passions and all this warmth and all this incredible love for music, which they have. Mm. And then you're trying to bring it into, into the music. And you know, talking about Romeo and Juliet, that's the essence of the piece. Yes. So, for me, uh, there was a process of exploration how we could how we could emotionally be unified, and also uh, technical things as with any orchestra, how to unify the articulation, the ensemble, the timbres, the amount of vibrato, for instance, or the bow speed. You know, all the things which are con- which conductors have to work constantly with uh, any orchestra. And uh, probably uh, most important is that uh, there's also this curiosity. So when I brought Miskowski, uh, nobody knew the composer. I, I guess maybe a few string players have played his uh, chamber music, but as a symphonic composer, nobody knew him. Mm. And Probably still, pretty true most of the world, I would think. You know, that... Well, I think he deserves much wider recognition, and I can't see why it can't be done. You know, yes. Recently, for instance, uh, Mishislav Weinberg, 
Yes, of course. Big revival. Kind of yes. Renaissance. Yes. And they also lived at the same time. They knew each other. Yeah. So uh, why this composer cannot who, have... Who would you direct people who were coming to Mierskowski for the first time? Which symphonies would you direct them to other than the 21st? Uh, probably is... also 27th, which yeah. will be the next release, by the way. It will be okay. parallel to with uh, Sh- Prokofiev VI. Oh, that, uh, uh, that, they, is a, that is a great piece, I think. We'll talk also, about it in a moment. But, uh, and they yeah. also written at the same year... Uh, and they also have a very, very different approach by two composers uh, at, the, at the same time. And in quite, s- well, not similar, but quite uh, common uh, living circumstances and even health circumstances mm-hmm. for them. Mm-hmm. But uh, for Miskovsky, it's definitely those two pieces, cello, concerto, it's mm-hmm. a beautiful, great piece. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's uh, also a couple of earlier symphonies. Number six is a very interesting piece. Uh, there's a lot of piano music, actually, uh, which is which possible to find. So in, he, he had a very versatile music. I, I would say I probably would not recommend to go to some Ode to Stalin, because uh, that was more of a commissioning <laughs> yeah. rather than... I don't think I'd go for any piece called Ode to Stalin. <laughs> you know, I... Sometimes I'm listening to them in, t- in terms of curiosity, and some of them are incredible. You know, if you talk about the same Prokofiev, the content for the 20th anniversary of October, incredible yeah. music. Yeah. And uh, you know, some of the Shostakovich, uh, if you talk about uh, the Festive Overture, yeah, 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 it, it's unbelievably great music. It yeah. it's just depends on the how seriously the composer was treating yeah, it, yeah. usually. Let's, let's um, reflect a little bit on the Prokofiev Sixth Symphony, which is going to be coming sh- shortly. Um, I, I think it's an extraordinarily searching, dark piece, and uh, in some ways the greatest of the symphonies for me. Uh, it is. Uh, f- also, it's written at the time when, after the victory, everybody was expecting some celebratory pieces. Mm. Even, I think there's even more celebration in Shostakovich 9. It's probably this celebration with a lot of grotesque, mm-hmm. but uh, at least there's much more vividness. Prokofiev 6 is almost in the beginning. I remember conducting it for the first time actually in St. Petersburg years ago. And uh, from the very beginning, it's feeling like you take a nail <laughs> and start to scratch on the glass with, uh, with yes. it on the window. Yeah. And then uh, this last movement, which is, it's so bitter. Uh, I mean, you, uh, you, yes. it, you kind of feel that it goes into, it, it, it tries. It really tries to revive itself. Yes, it really to tries to find, yes. find its spirit and yeah. find the reasons to continue in a little bit brighter mood. But then it goes towards this end where it's literally... Horrible, it's almost, horrible twist at the, at the end almost, of the piece. Well, again, you know, Prokofiev already started to have heart attacks and, you know, heart problems. And for him, there was probably also personal fear of mm. this, you know, one heart explosion mm. when he'll be gone. And, so that, for, and that very oppressive slow movement, which it is, you know, it's so saturated, the sound. Um, it it is, it is a piece... And, it is a piece which makes you think a lot. And actually, you know, with a fifth, uh, you probably have more answers than questions. With a sixth, mm. you have more questions than answers. Very good. Very and good. very, very opposite, Miskowski, who was already at the end of his life, he was older than Prokofiev, uh, at uh, his 27th, the last symphony, this very... It's a, it's a symphony filled with light, mm. and there's... No, there's neither victorious message or neither political message. There's neither struggle or fight. It's almost as those symphonies which brings you to the different dimensions. Mm. It's a chariot of life which goes away, which goes into who knows where. Who knows where we will be exist after the physical existence. Mm. With your different orchestras, uh, Vasily, what determines um, the, uh, the different repertoire you approach with them? Um, I suppose you, you're in discussions with the, the management of the orchestras about what repertoire you'll pursue with which orchestra, but what determines that? Is it their character? Is it their, um, well, you know, you know or is it more are, commercial than that? 
at the moment what determines this amount of musicians available on stage uh, yeah. because of the social distance and it's not just with of my course but that's going to change very soon um, uh, we hope yeah. we hope I'm we don't almost, know but yeah. we hope yeah uh, and if we're talking about 2019 in the years before uh, several reasons first of all i really believe that the orchestra have to pay a very decent attention to their national music mm -hmm. to their national composers yeah. uh, because if they want who will and i think the orchestras <laughs> in many ways uh, have to be used as a propaganda for their space for their culture and i think it's it's one of the main primary purposes mm -hmm. to show the excellence and the richness of the culture of the place where they based for the locals first of all and then for the world in general when they when the orchestra is going on tour because of that obviously uh, here in Liverpool for years I was playing a lot of British music and discovering a lot of British music and still discovering a lot of British well, music. Well I mean I was very complimentary about uh, about your Elgar um, and um, I, I, I still believe that I've never heard someone that that wasn't British coming to that music with such a, a clear understanding of, 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 of its language, um, of its particular phraseology and syntax. And, you know, I think it's remarkable. I think you were a Brit in a former life, actually. Yeah, I'm, I'm, yeah. <laughs> officially I'm British as well. Uh, the thing about Elgar, I supposed to actually in two weeks from now, uh, it's on the Christmas day, on Catholic Christmas day, but in Russia it's not a Christmas, on the 24th in Moscow, Second Symphony. Uh, oh. But uh, wow. because of the current restrictions, the only 25% of the audience allowed in the hall with social distancing and also social distance on stage. Mm -hmm. And the concert has to be repeated twice within three hours. Uh, so I decided that it will be very complicated to perform Elgar Symphony with yeah. a very small string layout. Yes. So instead of fit, I will do the Wand of Youth. Okay, yes, and lovely piece. This is uh, first time for me, so that mm -hmm. will be the next discovery in, of British music uh, in the tradition. Uh, last week, as we spoke in the beginning, I've done uh, Fasades, uh, the both suites with mm -hmm. recording with Royal Philharmonic Orchestra, which I have done before, but not in such complete version. Mm -hmm. So there's constant discoveries, yeah. and also other composers, you know, Walton, Rayquan Williams, Britain, I mean, there's plenty of uh, British what, composers. What do the Russians make of, um, of Elgar, for example? Have you performed Elgar in Russia before? I've done, I've done a few pieces. What do, they, what do they make of it? Uh, you know, Elgar is uh, pretty close to Tchaikovsky in his uh, explanations. It's somewhere you know, between Tchaikovsky and Rachmaninoff, but on top of it, it has this British politeness and grandeur. Uh, which uh, some Russian people makes them puzzled because mm. uh, if you talk, if you compare Tchaikovsky and Elgar, for instance, Tchaikovsky emotions are much more open. Mm. Uh, rather than Elgar emotions, sometimes are hidden and they. Uh, but they're there. For the, they're seething uh, they beneath the surface. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And they're taken for the longer, longer term. The same emotion. Tchaikovsky emotions are mercurial quite often. Mm -hmm. rather than uh, Elgar has the same emotion for a longer period of time. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, obviously, for string players, uh, it is very, very challenging pieces. So oh. when I'm playing uh, that with Russian orchestras, that's very interesting how they tackle all those difficulties, because in general, uh, the depth and the quality of education of string players in Russia probably one of the best in the, in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, so... This is uh, on one side. On the other side, there were famous Russian conductors, uh, Svetlana, for instance. Or yes, Jesus, indeed. He, or he was Jesensky, a great who champion of... Who yeah. were big champions yeah. of that. So it is quite close. Talking about Norway, uh, there were some discoveries for me. You know, music by Halvorsen, for instance, or mm. Svensson, or yes. Geert White. Because everybody knows only Greek from Norway. There's quite a few more, mm. Alfen. Yes. And uh, for me, it also was a case to discover and to perform such a magnificent music. Yeah. The other part, which I think is very important and vital in terms of repertoire, is to give a certain amount of premieres every year, because this is, I think, again, what every orchestra have to do. 
Mm-hmm. Obviously, giving priorities to their local composers, living composers, mm-hmm. but uh, also commissioning the pieces for the composers from the other countries and yes. other continents. Because uh, you know, what we know now from classical music is probably one out of thousand pieces. Yes, written. of course. It becomes and a museum culture otherwise, doesn't it? it not, if we not don't just keep re- restoring it. Not just that. I, I think it's not just that. It's, it's what we know now. For instance, we know Mozart, but at the time when Mozart was writing this, uh, his music, Salieri was by far more popular. Mm-hmm. And uh, we know Johann Sebastian Bach because Mendelssohn did this festival in his life. If he if he wouldn't, we probably would know Karl Philipp Emanuel <laughs> Bach rather than Johann mm. Sebastian mm. Bach. Mahler, if Lenny Bernstein would not propagate <laughs> yes. his symphonies that heavy, That's true. we probably will play some old symphonies by Mahler, but it's before... The pandemic was one of the most popular composers of uh, all repertoire. Yes. So for that, it is Vox Populi plus some luck, which makes this or that composer uh, more known and eternal. Yeah. Uh, but to be able to become eternal, to be able for a public to decide what piece is masterpiece and what piece will be neglected, you have to give it a chance. Of if the course. piece is not performed, then there's no chance. There's no chance, absolutely. Because, because of that, I think it's the duty of conductors and the orchestras to perform contemporary music be- and commission the new pieces. However, uh, I was always trying, and I'm still trying, to program it such in such a way that you also have some popular item in the program, that it's not those 200 very famous gurus who were on this <laughs> concert uh, and listened to this piece and spoken to each other only, but that it's a broader mass of people who came probably to listen better than well, Eureka. That's, that's one of the glories of the promenade season, the BBC's prom season in London, that Hopefully. they mix new commissions yeah. with, yeah. with, you know... Um, Hopefully. We actually now, uh, with various orchestras, I'm now in discussion with proms for the next season, what and how will happen... In the yeah. next season, yeah. it's not yet. Uh, no, of course, defined. of course, but um, it's not yet even defined what at what uh, scale it will be. To be but honest. things are moving quite fast now with regard to vaccines. So I think the summer is a little bit more optimistic in its well, prospects. We we will see. You know, yeah. the thing is, uh, to me, uh, obviously, you know. Humanity has a great scientific and medical power, so at some point it will be found. But, uh, for instance, if uh, the best comparison for this virus of COVID at the moment is probably flu. Mm -hmm. Does a flu have a vaccine? Mm. Mm. So many strains. Yes. And the same. Now at the moment there's 21 strains of COVID exist. Mm. Mm. Luckily we have only one which is more aggressive and uh, more dangerous but what's going to happen in the future what uh, what i'm trying to say is that with flu we just don't have any lockdowns in the, in the flu seasons yeah i hope that with all those medical treatments and with all acknowledgement and studies of this relatively new virus yeah uh, what will happen that the people will treat it as another seasonal virus of course we future. learn to live with it yes Yes. Um, let, talk to me about your, um, your new position with the Royal Philharmonic, you know, about, about to become their new music director. This is very exciting for, for a lot of us because I feel that... You, you know, don't need is... to travel to Liverpool. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, it's, it's just that this was Thomas Beecham's famous orchestra. And, you know, uh, I think in recent years um, I, it's, it's lacked a, an identity... Uh, and I think an identity necessarily comes from the top, and whoever is music director will give it an identity. Um, so I'm, I'm excited by this prospect, and I'm wondering what sort of plans you're putting in place as we speak, what sort of repertoire you might be exploring. Well, there's plenty of plans, obviously, and uh, to me the most important is that this orchestra has plenty of potential, understanding of its current position, understanding of uh, where they are now, and very clear view where the orchestra wants to be 
uh, in few years. Okay. And also understanding what uh, steps need to be taken. And it's not just about uh, the administration management, which is fantastic. I think probably one of the best young managers in the country, John, uh, James Williams. Yeah. Uh, but it's also understanding from musicians. It's in many ways self-governing orchestra. And it is important that musicians who also taking part in decision making, they are understand uh, what steps have to be taken, even in a very difficult circumstances as we live now. Talking about repertoire, this season was planned as three big Mahler choral symphonies, number two, number three, number eight. Mm -hmm. Number eight was planned as a joint project between Royal Liverpool Philharmonic and Royal Philharmonic Orchestra with plenty of choirs and huge forces in Albert Hall. Mm -hmm. However, life is what we have at the moment, so this project is postponed now, hopefully for two seasons. Mm. Uh, next uh, year we will explore uh, the big British oratorios, so there's uh, the Dream of Gerontius, Belshazzar's Feast and War Requiem. Wonderful. And uh, obviously all the versatile repertoire. The novelties for the orchestra will be uh, less, I wouldn't say commercial gigs, less uh, light music mm. and more of the core repertoire. We hope that uh, we will still continue as it was planned before the pandemic. And there will be a series of concerts outside of the proms in the Royal Albert Hall constantly. So okay. it's almost like subscription series yes. in Albert Hall in the autumn, winter and spring. Uh, there will be more concerts in Royal Festival Hall, more presence of the orchestra in Royal Festival Hall. Hopefully, again, it's all subject of their conditions. And uh, there will be also... A very special project in uh, Kerrigan Hall. Mm -hmm. So, for, and all three, in my point of view, they can complement the broad range of repertoire for the orchestra. So, Albert Hall, obviously, this is for the big, 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 big pieces. Big pieces, yeah. Not necessarily just choral, okay. but you know, big yeah. things. Uh, Royal Festival Hall, uh, this is for main repertoire and also probably for some of the premieres of the new contemporary pieces of music or something less known like the same Miskovsky symphonies for instance uh, and uh, Cadogan Hall this is for uh, the first Vienna school repertoire Beethoven, Mozart, yes. Haydn which is vital for any orchestra for its development yes. plus neoclassical and some of the 20th century uh, repertoire. It's this tricky. It's tricky hall. That it's very easy to overplay it because um, it's, it's. Yeah. That's why I think uh, even Tchaikovsky. I've played the various big symphonies, but even Tchaikovsky late symphonies are quite difficult there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, this is for the audience who coming there, and I had these uh, impressions from the audience uh, expressed to me after the concert that. Uh, it's no other halls in London gives you such a feeling that you are in the music, in the orchestra, sure. that you, it's so full. Mm. It's very immediate. Uh, yeah, it really it's very, is. Yeah. And very immediate. So yeah. uh, th all three venues, they can sure. serve as uh, three different areas of the orchestra repertoire. Plus there's future plans, hopefully, again, when the pandemic is over, those plans will go as it went before with the scheduling of it, uh, of the new office space for the orchestra management, of the new rehearsing facilities for the orchestra. Good stuff. And uh, because, you know, I think in London uh, there's a lack of good rehearsing facilities for the orchestra. Mm -hmm. uh, LSO rehearse in St. Luke, which is a great venue, but acoustically it's probably not ideal. Mm. Uh, and all the others rehearsing in Henry Wood Hall, mm. which uh, for the big repertoire is quite condensed. It actually was very interesting last week uh, that uh, with social distancing there, it works acoustically much better. Okay. Uh, with the orchestra probably of the same size, but sitting tight together, uh, somehow reflection from the walls or something would go in, in terms of general acoustics or maybe amount of people, is because if it's more than 70. 
Uh, that's sometimes quite difficult to rehearse because you don't hear enough. And if people play louder than needed, then it's really deafening. <laughs> Rather than with uh, the small amount of players, it, it works very, very well. It was surprising. I mean, if if there won't be any problems with uh, heating, that would be absolutely fantastic. <laughs> Otherwise, it was a little bit chilly. A little bit on the chilly side. Well, you a should be used bit. to that, you know, being a, a Russian. Uh, <laughs> I spent probably too much time here in the Northwest. That's probably, absolutely. So, you know, there's, a, there's a plenty of plans. And uh, just to finish that, and there's still, we are planning plenty of tours, uh, even the nearest one, as it stays at the moment, might happen even in February. Wow, ah, fantastic. I, it amuses me that when we first met, the very first time we met, I was presenting a, a concert you did in Manchester with the BBC Philharmonic and you were performing Rimsky's Scherzade and uh, I had the cheek to mention in my introduction the, the, the famous Beecham recording of <laughs> with the Royal Philharmonic. Well, Little did I know. <laughs> this... Well, this one actually stays in my memory because of one reason. I, I actually, I probably you didn't know it. When you were doing uh, your bit in the interval of it, because it's all live. It yes, it is. BBC, yeah, absolutely. BBC Manchester, yes, right? Yes. So when you were doing, and I'm staying there uh, just behind the door, and then uh, the person should open me the door, and I'm walking on stage. At the very last moment when you say, then, please welcome back on stage Vasily Petrenko, the button on my trousers... <laughs> suddenly just bang <laughs> off and you have no other choice than to walk and conduct so i have to say that that was probably one of the most cautious conducting by me of all the time i did manage it so you know there's nothing happened you certainly and did <laughs> so but that was that's very memorable concept it, well me. there's there's no following that image uh, <laughs> <laughs> see and I thank you for your, for your time and your insights, uh, always interesting, and uh, um, look forward to spending more time with you in London. Thanks, Ed. It will be a great pleasure. We should do another podcast. Uh, we did about uh, the Shostakovich symphonies, do you remember, a while oh, ago? Oh, my goodness. They were, they, they, we were about four hours in the... But that was, that was just 15, so how about 27 symphonies? <laughs> I, I'll have to do some homework first. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Good to hear you. Thank you, Ed. Um, stay safe. And Thank you. Bye-bye.